Hi, I'm Siobhan Sarna, and I founded SIBO SOS so I could connect you directly with the people who are in the field and in practices and in the labs learning about SIBO and helping people with their gut issues. So it is a pleasure to share with you Dr. Ken Brown's masterclass. He is a very busy gastroenterologist. He also is a researcher, and he's also the one who created the only, only clinically shown supplement to help with bloating, and it's called Atrantil. You might be familiar with it. Ken is a dynamic speaker, to say the least. This was a very energetic class. We were laughing, we were crying, we were dropping our jaws on the floor with his observations and his ideas, and then going, oh my gosh, yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. He'll get you fired up, there's no doubt about it. So I'm excited to share this information with you. Enjoy Dr. Ken Brown. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is what I call my bridge the gap talk. This is a situation where I see a whole lot of people and the majority of people I see have come full circle. They have done the traditional medicine, they've gone to the functional medicine, and then they've come back in desperation to me. So this is both a scientific talk and it is actually a talk about my experience. So I call this the bridging the gaps in digestive health. So if you don't know who I am, my name is Ken Brown. I'm a board certified gastroenterologist in, Dax, in Dallas, Texas. And I'm still practicing. Um, I have the same passion that Siobhan does. And I just want to help people and I want to see people get better. The thing about this is my goals today may be a little bit different than the other speakers that you've had. My goals are pretty simple. I want to do a brief review. So if I start out and you're like, well, I already know this because this is a unique audience. A lot of your people already understand SIBO. Well, what I'm going to tell you is you need to learn how to teach others about SIBO. So the review, if it seems simplistic, is not really for you to learn anything. It's for you to learn how to teach other people because that's what I do. Every single day I see people that have been blown off by other doctors and I, I teach them how to teach their doctors. I want to tie a few things together. I have an innate desire to get geeky. If I lose you for a little bit, hang in there because then we'll come back and we'll tie it all together. But I do want to get a little geeky at times. I want to have a little bit of fun and talk some science. SIBO is not just about gut health. And ultimately, I want to make people go, hmm, when this thing ends and we do Q&A, I would love it if you guys have a bunch of questions about this. And if you just go, I've never thought of it that way, I would love it. All right, so Siobhan and Karen and company uh, have put on a fantastic specialty speaker summit. This is uh, the gastrointestinal endoscopy news. And I was asked to comment on this. And you can see these names here. So Dr. Satish Rao, Mark Pimentel, Brooks Cash, and myself. Um, I'm extremely honored to be considered um, somebody that can at least offer an opinion on this. I am not a professor of medicine at these academic centers. What I am is I'm a grunt. I'm the person out there seeing a whole lot of people all the time. My induction into this whole SIBO thing happened because Dr. Pimentel came to Dallas uh, about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, and started talking to me about the way that he has these animal models and the whole SIBO thing way before anybody else was thinking about it. That's how I got involved with these Zyfaxin studies. Now, why am I so passionate right now? Why am I spending my time on a Tuesday night one, you know, talking about this? About seven years ago, as I was trying to look at this and find natural ways to do this, natural ways to help my patients, a mother brought her son to me who was 18 years old or 17, and he had been handed off by the pediatric gastroenterologist. He had severe autism. 
The thing was, is that she said that whenever she fed her son, he became very combative, very violent, very aggressive. She actually had to quit her job to take care of him. And out of frustration, she came to me. That's when we treated his gut with natural products and CBD. And she showed back up with this son that was beautiful, perfect, the best he's ever been in 10 years. This is not about trying to fix IBS. This is about trying to change where we're moving as a society. So that's where this talk is going to go. I had that aha moment that I could make such a difference in somebody's life. We're going to do this for everyone. So the first part of this talk really is simple. My view is, is that we have this Venn diagram of IBS diet and leaky gut. Now, IBS is the thing that I was taught in fellowship and medical school, but this audience, what I love about this audience, this is what I meant by please just hang in there for a little bit because you're going to go, well, we all know this, but I want you to learn how to teach it to your doctors. Teach it to your friends. IBS affects 20% of the U.S. population. $30 billion a year are spent. To be diagnosed as IBS, it's, you just have to have abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, lasting three months. And the most common symptom, which is bloating, isn't even considered as a diagnostic criteria. So it's a trash can term. And we have all these different diagnoses that doctors use that are called trash can terms. So when a patient comes to me and they say, I have IBS, I'm like, you don't have IBS. We just haven't found the reason. That's my methodology behind this. So much like 30 years ago, we realized that ulcers were in the same exact spot. H. pylori was not discovered yet. A Australian gastroenterologist figured out that H. pylori caused ulcers. He swallowed it, proved his point. Everyone thought he was crazy, and he showed that no. It's bacteria at the bottom line. So when somebody says, and when I mean somebody says, I mean most of my partners do not believe in SIBO yet, but it's up to us in this community to try and change their minds that the exact same thing happened 30 years ago. So as we look at this, we know that we have 100 trillion species in our colon. That's our microbiome, and we know that Relatively speaking, we should have very few bacteria living in the small bowel. So if we were to think of this, look at it like this. If you get sick, take antibiotics, or most importantly, have an infection, then bacteria can start to grow where they shouldn't. That shocks your intestine. I just got off the phone with a patient who got sick in Mexico five years ago, and she was like, man, I was perfect until that happened. Then when the bacteria start to break down the food before you can, you realize that that gas, the hydrogen gas, can be absorbed by other bacteria. And in one example, it can actually be converted to methane by these methanogens. And I think that most people listening to this are like, yeah, we get it. But I'm going to get into a little bit deeper about this. We're going to go into the methane and the hydrogen sulfide here in a second. But let's look at this and think. Okay, so the methane slows everything down. More bacteria can grow. It's, and then you can produce more methane. So basically, you have this cycle. This is exactly why people can have post infectious IBS. You can even have post-infectious IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease. So the post-infectious IBS means that something happened and now bacteria start to grow. SIBO, no brainer for everybody listening here. 20% of the gas is actually absorbed. That means 80% is going to go to the colon. Now we have a reason for IBS-C, irritable bowel with constipation. I've always had a problem diagnosing patients having irritable bowel when you have opposing symptoms, diarrhea and constipation. Now we have a reason why they could have constipation. Okay, slight digression here. I heard Dr. Pimentel on a podcast talking about how methane actually causes 
that paralytic effect. And it's so cool because his researchers have discovered with animal models that it actually causes high amplitude contractions that don't move. You don't have the peristaltic contraction. So this is an article um, from Neurogastroenterology and Motility where it looked at the effects and the mechanism of methane on animals that were infused with methane in their ileal area. So they were anesthetized, they were given methane. The reason why I wanna show this is because methane, when infused, actually causes very high, unpredictable contractions. Then what they did is this group of researchers, I'm gonna move this out of the way. This group of researchers then infused a neurotoxin, tetrodotoxin, which blocks the neuron. And what happened is they blunted the effect of the methane. For everyone that's listening, everyone that suffers, what I'm saying is as we learn more about this, we realize that the methane isn't just affecting the muscles. It's causing a molecular issue with the neurons. So this could be a potential form of treatment in the future if we could learn how to manipulate the nerves. We've always wondered how methane can actually do this, and it can do it because it affects the nerves. So let's look at this picture right here. Methane, Siobhan, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, perfect. So they infused methane. It created a high amplitude, non-effective contraction. If we look at this wave right here, that is what we call a peristaltic contraction. Here, when methane hits, your intestines cramp and they don't do anything. This is why if you suffer from this, you hurt, you bloat, and you get frustrated. Now we realize that if you can actually infuse a nerve blocking agent, it is quite possible that you stop it. So they infused the methane, they gave the TTX, and it actually blocked the methane's effect. I bring this up because I think in the future, as we, as we move on for treatment, these are possibilities of something like that. So what about diarrhea? Wait, Dr. Brown, before you move, can I just ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. The neuron, can you just describe exactly scientifically, but for lay people, what the neuron is in that example? Well, this is, it gets a little complex because what we realize is, is that the neuron, and we'll get into this a little bit later, about the movement between the interstitial cells of Kajal. And like I said, we're going to get geeky in this talk. The interstitial cells of Kajal are like cell towers that send one signal to another. And what happens is that it appears, and this is not my specialty, and I'll defer to Dr. Pimentel on this because he has great research on it, but these, this is a totally different group that just proved that they could block it. Somehow the methane is affecting the motility. What that means is SIBO is a motility issue more than anything. When you screw up the motility, you allow the bacteria to grow. So the neuron is the cell telling the next cell to move. Does that make sense? It does. Is a neuron a nerve? A neuron is a nerve conduit. It Thank tells you. the next nerve to do something. Thank you. Cool. Does that make sense? Yeah, and when you're saying the, the cells, the neurons are cells like cell towers, you mean telephone cell phone towers. I mean, you can, in any way that you think that one tower talks to another, whether it's electrical, whether it's cellular, whether it's anything like that. Yes, that is kind of the towers because we're going to get into that in a little bit about how that changes. I don't view SIBO as a, this graph makes us think that SIBO is not a physical motor problem. It is a nerve problem. 
And we have to work on the motility if we're going to help people. And that's where the future of all of this is headed. Perfect. Makes sense? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. So what about diarrhea? Um, I had mentioned earlier that I was struggling with the fact that we have IBSC, we have IBSD, we've got methane, and now we have a actual mechanism of how methane can affect this. So if methane can affect and cause constipation, why do we have diarrhea and we call it the same thing? Well, this is a very savvy audience and we know now that that's probably related to hydrogen sulfide. I have watched the other speakers on your circuit and uh, Dr. C. Becker does an amazing job of discussing the nuances of hydrogen sulfide. I'm gonna take it a little deeper level. So if anybody's listening, and they have not watched that, I suggest that you um, go ahead and take a look at Dr. Seebecker's lecture because she did a great job of going into hydrogen sulfide, but I want to go a little deeper. In fact, hydrogen sulfide can cause diarrhea, but why else should we care about this? My goal with discussing this with everyone right now isn't so much to say I want to fix your gut, but I want to fix your body. I think we're completely missing how important this process is. So this is an article out of 2019, recently published, where it looked at cysteine-derived hydrogen sulfide. It's a matter of endogenous or bacterial origin, meaning if your body produces hydrogen sulfide or if the bacteria produce it, does it matter? So as it turns out, it's a little bit of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, stick with me here because I'm going to get a little geeky and then we're going to come back out, okay? Okay. Has anybody else talked about this yet, Siobhan? Um, Dr. Greg Nye, who I need to hook you up with touched on it in his, uh, not the good, the bad, the ugly with Clint, but um, he's touched on the sulfur philosophy and hypothesis. So we can't wait to hear. So, yes. Yeah, so I've read a lot of Dr. Greg Nye's um, stuff and you and I have talked about this in the past uh, where he has discussed how glyphosate can actually affect the enzymes that prevent the conversion of sulfite to hydrogen sulfide and it could be an adaption of our bodies to that. Is that correct? That's you got correct. it, yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going a totally different direction. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, so this is a completely different direction. All right, the good, this is what's so cool. The good, when you eat products that have cysteine and you endogenously, and what endogenously means is that when your cells use these amino acids like cysteine and you can have an enzyme and it's a really complex enzyme, but let's just call it CBS. When the CBS enzyme takes cysteine in, it will form hydrogen sulfide intracellularly and then use that to make energy for the cell. In addition, on the outside, when the cells are exposed to cysteine, your paracellular ability to convert cysteine to hydrogen sulfide is actually really good. So low levels of hydrogen sulfide produced by the body improve the mucus layer of your intestines. Say it again. When your body does the conversion itself, it's really good and it improves the mucus layer. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now the bad. SIBO. When you have a bunch of bacteria that are actually converting the, you have sulfate reducing bacteria. When you have a bunch of bacteria converting the cysteine, and I say cysteine because ultimately it's cysteine that gets converted to hydrogen sulfide. Forget about what that is. That's an amino acid that's in protein. But when you have too much hydrogen sulfide 
we now know it does a couple things. Your body will run out of the enzyme that can convert it, and hydrogen sulfide starts increasing, and you end up depleting the mitochondrial ATP. What that means is your cell gets tired and it can't convert the hydrogen sulfide to an energy producing substrate. So the good is your body knows what to do with it and it can handle it. The bad, when bacteria grow too much, they get the cells to waste their energy trying to get rid of it and you deplete the oxygen, which results in inflammation. Remember that, okay? Now the ugly. Holy cow, this is nuts. As it turns out, when you continue with this inflammation and you deplete this, there are new studies that actually show that when you block the CBS enzyme, because there's too much hydrogen sulfide, they have shown that this rapidly allows cells to use glucose to grow into cancer. I'll say it one more time. In colonic tissue, for instance, they took colonic tissue and they realized that when you expose it to hydrogen sulfide, you will take a colon polyp, which is an adenoma, and it will grow into cancer very rapidly. This is why I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is when you have the human-derived amount, it's fantastic. It works as an anti-inflammatory. When SIBO people produce it, you cause inflammation. If you don't put it in check, you increase your risk of cancer. Is that stuff that Dr. Nye was talking about? Um, no, and I just want to say a couple of things here. I don't know if you guys can see me or not. Oh, um, but whatever. What the heck is what I have to say? Right. It's nuts, isn't it? This what? is a 2019 article. I'm telling everyone right now, this isn't about your gut anymore. And I'm going to show you a whole lot more that I'm going to go on a war path. And my mission is to protect... I mean, I, I do colonoscopies. My sole job is to prevent cancer from happening. And we've got people that are developing hydrogen sulfide in their colons, developing cancer. And I've got doctors that don't even believe that this exists. What the heck is right? So, good. Now, who cares about cancer, right? Who cares about inflammation? What else has SIBO been linked to? Depression, fatigue, sleep disturbance, migraines, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, interstitial cystitis, pelvic pain, prostatitis, restless leg. This whole column is considered basically trash can diagnoses. If you've ever been diagnosed with any one of these things, it's because they don't have a reason for it. Every one of these diseases I have reversed by treating bacterial overgrowth. Now we realize that rosacea, acne, coronary artery disease, diabetes, obesity can all be related to this. So this is no joke. We have to figure out how to fix this. First thing we have to do is diagnose it. Now, in full disclosure, you have experts on this whole series that are much better at this than I am. For instance, IBS Smart, Vinculin, CDT antibodies, CDTB antibodies. Dr. Pimentel developed that. Jejunal culture, that's Dr. Rao's thing. Breath tests, I mean, Dr. Seebecker and Dr. Pimentel are experts in this. Um, I don't do, I do some of the IBS Smart. I certainly don't do any of the Jejunal cultures because my lab is not prepared for that. So we're kind of left with breath tests. And in my practice, it's very difficult because I'm the full circle. I have the people that went to a traditional doctor, then went to a functional doctor or several, and then came back to me. And um, so I don't have the liberty of doing a bunch more tests. They're frustrated. They've spent a lot of money. All I can say is that when I look at them and say, look, 
I'm, I'm sorry that you are frustrated that nothing has gotten better. Uh, there was this one article in 2017 that showed that there's significant heterogeneity in test performance, preparation, and so on. So in my practice, I look at everyone and say, you've spent enough money, we've done enough tests. Contrary to what some of the, of the other experts have said, and I fully acknowledge that, that if you start out with one of them, and if I go to Cedar sinai I believe Dr. Pimentel's test. If I go to Dr. Seebecker's lab, I'm quite sure that her breath test is fantastic. What I have is people showing up with a, 10 different breath tests that they've done through, through I won't say names, just through a bunch of different um, companies. So if you are somebody that had something happen, like you went to Mexico, you got sick, and then you never quite recovered, well, you look like a duck, you quack like a duck, you walk like a duck, and you have a bunch of tests that you've already seen. So let's just try treating you and let's see what happens. So rather than discuss the diagnosis, because you have other experts who have discussed that, I want to talk about the treatment. So the treatment that's actually been published, Zyfaxin, um, that's how Dr. Pimentel and I met. I did the original studies on Zyfaxin with him as a study site in Dallas. That was approved by the FDA as IBSD only, so diarrhea only. Herbal antibiotics, probiotics, and atrantil. Uh, and we'll get into all of these really quick. This is the New England Journal of Medicine study um, where it looked at this. Now, I want to say that what got published is not what I see in clinical practice. My response rate for IBSD is significantly better than was actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I think it's because my, my patient population is, was handpicked for this. So do not be frustrated if you read the, the journal articles and go, well, that's only 9% better than placebo. I have way better response rates than this. I still use a ton of Zyfaxin. Herbal antibiotics, Dr. Seebecker mentioned this. Uh, essentially, they were shown to be equivalent to rifaximin in one small study where it looked at uh, breath tests. Probiotics, this is the real tough one. There was a consensus statement that came out where they did not indicate that probiotics are very effective in a broad patient population over a long-term situation. But we all know that probiotics work in individuals. We all know that some people do really well. I don't get the people that do well. So in probiotics, what is it? Is it the wrong strain? Is it the wrong delivery system? What are we doing? We're, we're learning on this one. So I don't bash probiotics, but what I really like to do is just say, maybe we need a little bit more data on this. And doing clinical research is very difficult because there's all different kinds of people, all different kinds of probiotics. I did just recently interview um, Kiran Krishnan, who is the chief medical officer of Megaspore Biotic, and we got into a deep dive about the science of probiotics and why some are good, some are bad, and so on. So that is something that is fascinating to me because Eamon Quigley is the godfather of probiotics. And when I saw him at a meeting, he just mentioned that they do amazing things in a Petri dish but we just cannot reproduce them in large clinical trials. And I think that there's too many variables for that. But my bottom line with my patients is, if it works, right on, keep doing it. Most of the time, they come to me because it's not working. So we tend to try and find other aspects. And that's how I ultimately ended up developing this. So full disclosure, I developed this thing called Atrantil, which is a polyphenol blend of... Um, three different products that synergistically work, and this is because of some animal data. So we did a placebo-controlled trial, and what we found is, is that we really improved constipation and we really improved bloating, and we significantly improved people that had failed everything else. So what had happened is that I treated a, a handful of people that had failed everything else. We knew that we were onto something. Now, why were we onto something that is different than what had actually been published? And the reason I believe is because the molecules that we're using are polyphenols. These are, are the very complex, beautiful molecules predominant in the Mediterranean diet. 
this is what makes the skins of fruits and vegetables very colorful. What they are are very large molecules that are poorly absorbed. Listen to that term, poorly absorbed, and they go to the colon where they're broken down by colonic bacteria. When you have bacteria growing where it shouldn't, you can see that there are all these hydroxyl bonds. This is what an OH is. They work like a hydrogen sink. They work to soak up gas. So these polyphenols were actually very well researched in the animal world. Here's an example of a pig population, believe it or not, that in 2013, environmental biotechnology, inhibition of hydrogen sulfide methane in total gas production and sulfate reducing bacteria in vitro, meaning in a Petri dish, by um, tannins with focus on condensed quebracho tannins. So this is the same molecule that is the workhouse, that is the workhorse in Atrancil. That I did most of our research on quebracho. So we know that livestock produce a lot of manure. And that manure can be used to grow crops and such. But it also produces a lot of hydrogen sulfide and a lot of methane. So these guys did this amazing experiment where they took uh, test tubes and they put both quebracho, actually they took controls of the manure. They checked the amount of methane and the amount of hydrogen sulfide coming out. And then they added quebracho to it. What they found is there was an 80% decrease in hydrogen sulfide production and a 90% decrease in sulfate reducing bacteria. So the bacteria themselves were being produced, or the bacteria themselves were being eliminated and there was a decrease in the actual gas. And by chance, they were looking at the hydrogen sulfide, but they said, well, is it decreasing methane production? There's an 85% decrease in methane production when they mix the two together. That's how come that we actually started looking into this. In animal models, we know that this is going on in ruminants. So if a ruminant, meaning a cow, um, is eating, they actually have these different bacteria, And this is how they break down the cellulose that they eat. There was another really cool experiment that was done in the amino acid journal in 2018. And what they did is that they took human colonocytes and they soaked it in hydrogen sulfide. And what they were able to show, remember earlier when I was talking about the oxygen consumption, they were able to show that the colonocytes got depleted in oxygen and that led to inflammation. That earlier slide that I had were the good, the bad, and the ugly these guys actually proved it on actual tissue. And then they added polyphenols and the polyphenols bound up the hydrogen sulfide and they stopped the reactive oxygen species and reversed that effect. Say it again. Hydrogen sulfide took all the oxygen out of the cells the polyphenols brought it back. Keep that in mind. Because we're not just talking about SIBO. Remember, this is a Venn diagram. This is my life. And the next thing that I want to go to is leaky gut. So we're going to get a little less geeky now. So if you're thinking that I'm going to keep talking science the whole time, we're going to change it up a little bit. Do you recognize that, Siobhan? Is that me? No, that's not you. You know what, before you move on, I definitely want to hook you and Dr. Nye together so you guys can chat because when I said that he was not thinking that way, I don't know. I can't understand all of it. So you guys <laughs> probably, you know, have a lot of overlap, uh, but I can't wait for you two to like, I'd love to be a butterfly on the wall listening to you guys. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. You're like both geniuses in your own right. Um, and now we'll talk about leaky gut, but guys, this... I, my mind is being blown. I don't know about you. My mind is being blown. Keep going, Dr. Brown. Thank all you. Right. So we're all here to help each other. So this is, what, this is what's really 
um, this is the coolest thing about what you've done. You've taken the time to put this webinar together and I'm just trying to show you. Um, and when you ask me to do talks like this, I get to discover some new things. So I get better because of it. We all get better. I'm just hoping that we can help some people. The reason why that I have this slide is because this is 95% of my colleagues. They have their head in the sand. If you walk into a doctor's office and you say, I have leaky gut, they're just ignoring it. Part of the problem is that if you go on the internet and say, what is leaky gut? This is pretty much how it's described by Dr. Oz, Dr. Axe, and a bunch of other internet prominent people. They describe it as this large hole in, in the intestine. And that's not what that is either. Um, although this is a very fun video to watch, in my opinion, because it's a, uh, it's leaky gut described with sheep. So, but unfortunately it's way more complex than that. It's not sticking your head in the sand and it's not just letting big giant holes through the fence. This is an exquisitely complex rendition of what leaky gut really is, which is you have different gates. I've met with scientists around the world and they're doing their thesis on certain aspects. Zonulin, Claudin, I mean, there's so many different F-actin. It's too much. Think of it this way. You have three main gates. These three gates, when they become compromised, they lead to issues. How do they become compromised? Well, one way is if you have SIBO or an infection, zonulin or diet. So Dr. Nye can talk about glyphosate and different things like that. All three of those things can actually affect those three gates. And what I'm talking about is this gate, this gate, and this gate. When that happens, we have leaky gut. There is no doubt about it. Leaky gut exists. If you went to your doctor and said, I have leaky gut, and they said no, they're not reading the literature, period, because it's all there. What are the results of leaky gut? Mm, I don't know. Type 1 diabetes, liver disease, thyroid issues, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, celiac. I believe that all autoimmune disease can actually be traced back to the gut. Why are we having an epidemic of autoimmune disease? It has to be related to the gut, and it has to come down to inflammation. Inflammation is the root cause of everything. So this is just a very complex slide that shows when you start turning on B and T cells, they start releasing inflammatory markers. I bring this up because TNF-alpha, for instance, is the one that we go after in Crohn's disease and an ulcerative colitis. And people are spending $10,000 a month on Remicade and Humira and these other products to try and stop this one thing when the reality is inflammation is the root cause of everything. This is not new. In 2004, Time did a whole article on the secret killer, the surprising link between inflammation and heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's. The whole magazine was talking about end organ stoppage. Pharmaceutical companies are developing drugs to protect the end organ, meaning you start having Alzheimer's, let me give you something for your brain. Alzheimer's, let's improve your memory. That's not necessarily what we need to do. We need to start changing the paradigm of how we look at this. So, when we look at the inflammatory process, if we can think that your body looks at different things. Remember when I said the mucus production? The mucus production is there to protect these tight junctions from the outside world. When hydrogen sulfide becomes too concentrated, this thing becomes thin. When it becomes thin, your body can be exposed to allergens, bacteria, defensins, and then your three gates become compromised. When they become compromised, your immune system gets turned on. But I want to show this one thing here. Mast cells become irritated. If a mast cell becomes irritated, it is in really close contact to what is called an enteric nerve. 
So this is fairly new within the last 10 years that we realized that mast cells are an inflammatory cell that when it becomes irritated by leaky gut, it dumps histamine, serotonin, and proteases, and they happen to live within two microns of an enteric nerve cell. That enteric nerve cell is the direct conduit to the central nervous system. So now we have a reason why we have a gut-brain connection. That's just one. Now we're learning that there's more. So all of my patients that come to me and they say that they have these gut issues and I ask, do you have a foggy brain? They go, yes. Do you have fatigue? Yes. I'm like, okay. Did your other doctors want to put you on antidepressants? Yes. Let me explain to you exactly why I think your gut is causing it. And that gives them relief. It's this gut brain connection. So it's not my theory. <laughs> it's actually really important. These are all documented studies that have been shown recently within the last, I don't know, 2016 to 2019. I pulled these up. Gut microbiota disorder and dementia. Does your gut microbiome affect dopamine? That's depression right there. Does your gut microbiome affect you in inflammatory bowel disease? If you have Crohn's or colitis, please forward this talk to all your friends, family members that have Crohn's or colitis because that's my field and that's who I'm fixing right now and we're doing it by protecting their gut. Oh, autism. That's a huge one. Now we've got studies to show that the microbiota gut brain access and its potential therapeutic role in autism spectrum disorder. This is why I said in the very beginning, my goals are to tell you that SIBO is not about your gut. SIBO is about your health. We need to improve our health lives, not just our lifespan, our health span. Because when you have an inflamed gut, you can have an inflamed brain. This is the key here. I'm going to say it one more time. When your gut is inflamed, you can have an inflamed brain. And the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because there are epidemics going on right now that we need to prevent. And I think we can do it through the gut. And unfortunately, I feel like we're heading in the wrong direction. This is why it's happening. We now have scientific evidence to show how we can develop a leaky brain. So if doctors aren't even believing the leaky gut thing, I'm gonna throw them a curveball and say leaky brain. Not BSing. This is an article out of the Biochemical and Biophysical Research Communications published recently that discussed how inflammatory markers, and more importantly, zonulin, rapidly increase the permeability of blood, brain, and small intestinal epithelial barriers. What these guys did, it's so cool. They took human tissue and soaked it in a bath of different inflammatory markers that would typically be associated with our body's response to lipopolysaccharides, meaning they soaked it in a bath that our bodies respond to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which includes zonulin. And they showed that it created intestinal permeability. Then they took a blood brain barrier, which is supposed to be the barrier, which is a one way process to prevent your brain from becoming inflamed, and they were able to reproduce the exact same thing in the blood-brain barrier. They showed that gut inflammatory markers can create a leaky brain. And that is novel, but you're gonna see why it's relevant here in a second. This is a really cool study because everybody's talking about CBD right now. Um, this is a super cool study published in the inflammatory bowel disease of this year where it looked at, forget that big long word called palmit, 
T of lithonamide, just call it PEA, which is what it's known. It's an atypical endocannabinoid. But the important thing is cannabidiol, CBD. What they did is that they took tissue from humans and they exposed it to inflammatory markers. And in a Petri dish, they created inflammation. They showed intestinal permeability looking at mass spectrometry where they showed how many molecules, what size, blah, 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 super scientific went through once it was exposed to inflammatory markers. Then they added CBD to it, CBD PEA. They did PEA in one and CBD in the other. And shockingly, it prevented leaky gut. It actually reversed the inflammatory process. So these same researchers went, holy cow, this is nuts. We have to look at this more. So let's look at it in humans. Everybody's talking about animal studies and petri dish studies and everything. So they actually took, like, I think it was 23 volunteers. They took 23 volunteers and they gave them high dose aspirin and they created leaky gut. They created leaky gut by looking at a mannitol lactulose test, which is kind of an old school test. Mannitol is a very small molecule. Lactulose is a very big molecule. So when you check the amount of lactulose to mannitol ratio in the beginning, mannitol should be absorbed and you pee it out. Lactulose, you don't absorb and you poop it out. Then if you create leaky gut, some of the lactulose molecules will slip through and you'll pee it out. Then you can actually show this is leaky gut. They created leaky gut in humans and then they gave them CBD and it reversed it. Keep this in mind because this is the future of where we're headed. SIBO causes leaky gut and it's real. Do you have a question, Siobhan? No, I'm just still having my mind blown like <laughs> continually throughout this. I'm throwing a ton out there. That's why I said my goals are to review some simple stuff and then I'm going to geek out and this is all part of the geeking out and I just want, I want to create discussion with your community. That's mainly my deal. So let's back it up a little bit and let's go to something a little more simple like diet. Okay. okay. So now we covered IBS, SIBO, leaky gut. Now let's go to diet. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. The famous quote by Hippocrates, which is debated whether or not he said it, but that's a whole separate thing. Um, food, it all comes down to diet, doesn't it? So I'm not going to talk too much on diet here. You have other experts who have discussed this in detail. The two diets that I discuss most frequently with my patients are FODMAP, most people listening to this understand what this is, fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyols, meaning the reason why FODMAP gets discussed with gastroenterologists, it has a great name. And I have colleagues that recommend FODMAP, and they don't even understand what it is. I'm not that big of a fan, because what it's been shown in clinical trials is that 52% showed improved pain, and there was a 28% IBS score improvement. If you remember in the very beginning in that gastroendoscopy news where it was me, William Che, Mark Pimentel, and Satish Rao, William Che has done incredible works on this. And he has shown that if you stay in a FODMAP for too long, you may end up with micronutrient deficiency. I have had success not putting people on FODMAPs because I think some of these things are really good for you. I think avocado is awesome. I'm, I think that's a great, good fat for you. Let's talk about gluten-free real quick. I'm not gonna go into um, all the other diets that are available, the SCD diet, the elemental diet, the, the, the SIBO diet. The, I mean, there's a bunch out there. I have to keep it simple for my patients because they've done everything already. Um, what we can see is that when you actually go gluten-free, you have a very similar decrease in IBS symptoms. Why do I make all my patients go gluten-free? It's because zonulin, is a protein produced when you have SIBO and some people when they're exposed to gliadin. I typically will not read from a slide, but I have to read from this one. 
Zonulin is the only endogenous protein shown to modulate epithelial tight junctions. Gluten, ingestion, and SIBO are the two key stimuli for zonulin release. Zonulin levels have been shown to be equal in IBS with gluten intolerance and those with celiac disease. So zonulin is the reason why I really try and get my patients to not do gluten. This isn't a fad. This isn't a, um, I think Dr. Nye will probably agree that with his work on glyphosate and such that wheat is one of the things that has some of the most um, high concentrations of glyphosate. Uh, one of the things I do like about the paleo diet, a lot of my patients already come on it. I have a lot of athletes that see me as patients and they have chosen to go on the paleo diet, CrossFit people, tri uh, triathletes and so on. Um, very little clinical trials on the paleo diet, but there are a couple small trials that show that it is equivalent to the Mediterranean diet in lifespan and inflammatory parameters. So I'm kind of a fan of the paleo diet. I myself live sort of a paleo kind of lifestyle, but I am definitely gluten-free. I'm gluten intolerant myself. Took me a long time to figure that out. Um, I was having Renaud's. Uh, Renaud's is when you have vascular spasm of your fingers. It's indicative that you have an autoimmune disease. I was having all kinds of digestive issues since I've gotten off gluten and a little more paleo. That went away. That tells me that I was actually affecting my immune system. So even people that live it, miss it sometimes it took me years to figure that out so what if the best medicine is just to close the gates meaning what if we take a step back quit making this so complicated and just figure out how to protect our barriers barriers being the intestinal barrier and the blood brain barrier it's a super hot topic right now so I've been working with scientists from around the world, and this is just from 2016, because the stuff that I'm being sent, I'm actually reviewing some of the articles for 2018, 2019. Nutrients, polyphenols and inflammatory bowel disease, they're looking at that. Effective cocoa and its flavonoids. A flavonoid is a subset of polyphenols on biomarkers of inflammation. Studies of cell culture, animal and humans, Critical reviews in food science, regulation of the intestinal tight junction by natural polyphenols, a mechanistic perspective. So a couple summers ago, I took my family to Spain. We're a big tennis family. This is why I have a picture of Rafa Nadal right here. Do you like, what is your favorite sport, Siobhan? Uh, sleeping. There we go. No, <laughs> yoga. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so we're a tennis family. Took my family to Spain, and you're looking around. People are still smoking. They wake up. They have cured meats for breakfast. They have bread for breakfast. They eat dinner at midnight. And people keep saying, oh, well, all the Europeans, just they just walk more than we do. And I went out. I purposely took a bus out to the suburbs of um, Madrid, suburbs of Madrid, and I'm like, no, a suburb is a suburb. People have to drive. They don't walk like they do in New York and all this other stuff. And then I started looking into it. And the average Spaniard eats 10 times the amount of polyphenols compared to the U.S. That's the Mediterranean diet. Here's what makes me angry. Americans have higher diabetes, coronary vascular disease, dementia, and cancer. These guys were walking around smoking. There's not gyms. They're eating whatever they want. They, I mean, there was, you know, dinner at midnight. It's not fair. We know that all health begins and ends in the gut. I say we all know because everyone on this webinar knows this. If we protect our guts, we can protect our health. So I have a couple, I have a, a, a couple man crushes. One of them is Alessio Fasano. He is the guy that discovered he's an italian pediatric gastroenterologist that discovered the molecule zonulin and whenever i get a chance to see him talk i try to go do it i went to the 2017 a4m meeting and his whole lecture was about leaky gut and autism and obesity being the epi the epidemic affecting our children and we have to put a stop to it it was brilliant and then i went to paleo fx david perlmutter a neurologist 
in 2017, the same year, starts talking about the epidemic of dementia and Alzheimer's. So we have cradle to grave going on right now. This is something has to change. There's an epidemic of childhood obesity and autism, an epidemic of adult dementia and Alzheimer's. According to these guys, and one of them is a pediatric gastroenterologist, but you've got guys like uh, William Davis, who's a uh, cardiologist. You know, we've got all these other people, Joseph Bercola, who are talking gut. Um, most people that are out there writing about it, they talk about the gut. Nobody's sitting there saying we have to fix our feet to help control the epidemics that are killing us. So it all starts from the inside. If you break an egg from the outside, it dies. If you let it heal from the inside, life comes out. And I thought that was a really good quote. I remember who told me that. So one of the things that I want to do for your audience right now is I, um, I think everyone should be able to protect their gut. I think everyone should be able to have the proper things. So, and thank you so much to our expert speaker. This is an opportunity for you to learn and move forward powerfully, powerfully to that next level. And then once you do, you might want to come back and re-listen and learn again about what the next step might be. So I did decide to put these on sale for you as well. If you wanted to own the SIBO SOS Masterclass Summit, you can buy each class individually for $59 and you'll get the transcripts and you'll get the recording and you'll get the PowerPoint presentation and the slides. However, if you wanted to get the whole bundle, I put it at a very special price of under $100 during this introductory free summit. So then if you did that, you would get the transcripts, the videos, the downloadable audio, the slides, as well as the 40 plus hours of Q&A. And just before you say, oh, well, those are other people's questions, they're not gonna really help me. The questions are so good and the answers are so smart and rich that even people who thought what I just said, you know, oh, it's not gonna work because they're other people's questions. They've written me and said, oh my gosh, that Q&A was amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, I didn't know that, that that was a possibility. Just lots and lots of aha moments across the board. So that's something you can do if you want. We do have that available for you. I would suggest it because I know the treasure trove that is in these hours and hours of expert information. And if it's not in the budget, I understand that too. So have at it in the free 24 hours per day, 48 hours total in the SIBO SOS Summit. Take care. I'll see you soon. Lots more to come in 2020.